When should we start? Now or uh, back in 69? Oh, uh, well, let's start back and work okay. our way up. Big one, ask the prime movers and then this. Okay. Uh, yeah, like uh, three, I'm the only one who graduated high school in the group. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's delinquent music. It's, what's good about this album is it's very, very carefully written. And uh, it's ultra, ultra simple music and every word and every chord counts. And that's why it's lasted. Uh, it's true that, that some of, of your lyrics that you got them for being a blues musician in Chicago. They're it's simple. Part of them are mixed up. They're mixed up blues lyrics, advertising jingles and uh, from uh, garage bands, uh, like Question Mark and the Mysterians had a song called 96 Tears. And I saw the, that was the first time I saw a number used. And I thought, 96, well this is 1969, that would look good too, and ergo the song, you know. So, uh, and uh, jazz too is present on this album, but it's quiet, you know, you don't notice it. It's a, it's a good piece of work. I'm really proud of it. Do you listen to it sometimes? I never listen to I only listen to my own records by accident. If I'm, if I'm out somewhere at a club or somebody's home, or it might come on in a commercial or on the radio and I happen to hear it, then that's a big thrill for me. And it's fresh that way, but I, no, I don't sit down and ever listen to them, ever. Never. When I make the things, I mean, from the time, just to write one song before I record it, I listen to it while I write it and rehearse it, I don't know, a thousand, I don't know how many times, many, many, many times, and then recording it, and then after the recording, many times, in, before it's released, and once it's released, that's it, goodbye. Yeah. Let's get one yeah. year ahead. All right. And Saxophone player, the guy who wrote yeah. Louie Louie, as a uh, this, this album uh, was, uh, this album was, I wanted to make a more sophisticated and a harder, more street music. It's influenced a lot by James Brown and John Coltrane. Those uh, things that were happening in the early 70s in, in black funk music and jazz. And it was, it's a white response to black funk music and jazz. Each, each, it was the exact live set you would have seen if you'd seen the Stooges then, in the order we played them on stage. It was recorded one song per day. We'd walk to the studio in Los Angeles, uh, I was 23 years old, and we'd record today's song over and over and over till we couldn't stand up anymore, 20, 30, 40 takes, and pick the best one and put it away and then do the next one the next day. And that's how it was done. Live, very, very live in the studio. I very, really like that record. Is it amongst your favorites? Yes, yeah. It took 10, 15 years until I realized how good it was. Because when I, when I make them, my, my expectations are very high. I aim really high and nothing's ever good enough. And it's like, that doesn't sound like it should. And then later, I heard it. I think it was in a club in Switzerland 12, 15 years later. I went, oh, what the fuck is that? And it, that's you. Oh, shit, you know? Wow. And it, and it sounded good. And then it has ever since to me. From the States to London and to this. This one was. CBS Studios. This one was really weird to make because it was. I was under pressure by that point. I'd lost the. Electra dropped me because the music wasn't commercial at that time. And uh, they, those albums on Electra have since gone into the black and they're making their money now and I get my royalty and everybody's happy. But uh, they had dropped me and so CBS wanted, CBS and my managers wanted me to make a commercial album with no stooges. They wanted a nice, just a charismatic lead singer but I wanted to make a Stooges album. So we made this and I took, I, I fought very hard to make this album. It's a very druggy album. Uh, there was a lot I had to do to defend my music at that time. It's a very extreme album. And uh, 
it, by the time this album was done, I was mentally unsound. <laughs> it was really like, ah! But I got the album made, and I'm lucky I did. Uh, back to L.A. and uh, James Williams. Yeah, again. I had been, I'd been dropped, CBS dropped me too. Their management dropped me, everybody dropped me. I was uh, a, living on the street and crashing around in people's apartments in L.A. and thought it was desperately important to make some product to keep going. Uh, people were offering me various straight projects, which I refused uh, to be the lead singer with, of a New York Dolls type band, or to to be uh, you know to be like David Cassidy or something. And I said no, 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 no. And instead, I wrote these songs with James Williamson. By the time we were supposed to go in the studio, I was in a I checked myself into a mental hospital because I had a I had a drug problem and. There were no treatment facilities widely available at that time. It was early in the heroin mess, and uh, there were no rehabs. So they they let me out on the weekend, and I recorded the vocals to this. And I'm really, what I like about this album is what it says about Los Angeles and American life at the time is almost exactly what the rap music from L.A. of 25 years later said. It's exactly the same thing. Kill City talks about it being a, a playground for rich people uh, and, and how I had a loaded gun and I'm, if, I may die, but I'm going to take you out on the way down if that's the way it's going to be. It was a very bitter, nasty little album. There are a lot of love songs, and in the love songs, basically, I hate every, all the girls I'm in love with. Uh, a lot of a lot of it's a nasty mean little album but i'm proud of i'm proud of it and i think it was prescient i think it was ahead of its time made it for three thousand dollars in jimmy webb's backyard nick kent the journalist found the tapes and sent them to france to skydog i don't know how this came out but this is a tape of the last stooges show basically and uh we were the night before i'd gotten in a punch up with a member of a biker gang and uh, I got the worst of it because he's much bigger than me. I'm not a great fighter anyway. So they uh, they all came to our gig and I challenged them on stage and people who, threw... Who here hates the Stooges? <laughs> right, right. It was the Scorpions from, uh, from um, Detroit and I had my own biker gang to protect me called God's Children and it was a basically a two, one giant punch up for an hour and a half. And uh, it's interesting, yeah. you know. There are also some good songs on this that, are, that don't appear on any other Stooges albums because we were constantly writing. So I think Cock in My Pocket and Head on the Curve are pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. I like the cover. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Rest in peace. <laughs> Berlin. Big switch. Uh, I. I realized the string had run out for me in terms of doing um, wild guitar band music. Uh, there was no longer anybody that could keep up with me in that regard, and I couldn't keep going in that game. So I did a switch. Bowie was doing very good work at the time, and he'd always wanted to produce an Iggy album and suggested we do so. So I said, let's go. And this is a, basically music by Bowie. He's almost the whole band on this. He plays half of all the instruments. And uh, lyrics and melodies by me. And it's a very dark, nasty little album. Basically, most of the, most of the lyrics on the album are about what it was like to hang out with David Bowie on the Station to Station tour. So it's all about Going, you were on it, yeah, the yeah. I was, I was hanging out with him. So it's all about spending, a, staying up all night, uh, doing naughty things. Mm -hmm. But Dum Dum Boys reflects. Dum Dum Boys is is reflective on the Stooges. That was his suggestion. He said, "Why don't you write a song about the Stooges?" And I thought, good idea. Bring it to a close and tell the story. So that's that's what we got. Someone says this is like 
the one your biggest could have been your biggest commercial success up to date? Well, this one's funny. Uh, Lust for Life was when it, I thought it was a hell of an album. I'd been back on tour. I had a strong band. I went in and recorded this in two weeks from from the beginning of writing it until the end of mixing it. Two weeks. Very, very fast. Uh, cocaine, sausages, and beer in Berlin. And uh, and it didn't it didn't hit at the time, but it has since been an enormous hit for me in a very strange way. Uh, many many corporations use this use Passenger. I've had covers up the ass on all the songs on this thing. The album itself was re-released and sells much better than it did. And uh, now Lust for Life is uh, used prominently in train spotting. And uh, next week I'm going to shoot a video for Lust for Life and it's going to be a single in July. So it took 19 years, <laughs> but uh, finally I'm going to get my single with it. The TVI, now Bowie was with you on tour. TVI was, uh, it's half of it is live with the, with the band that Bowie fronted. The other half is live with the, uh, the band after that, on the tour after that. And basically just, uh, just a nasty little rock and roll album. Some people hate it and some people like it. That's all I have to say about it. It was the last album for RCA. I'm freezing. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, we're taking it. In a... So cold. We take it quick. Yeah, okay. New values, James Wheeler coming in. Uh, new values is just, uh, it was my first album going completely solo after I'd worked with Bowie. And, uh, you know, I had never been comfortable. It took me years, 15 years, to be comfortable as a solo because I had been in a band and I missed that. And uh, I missed it doing this album, but I worked hard on the songwriting and I think the songwriting is good and it's a, it's a careful little album. It's recorded and played simply and it's, it's re-released now. I'm happy about it. Look, it's a guy looking for some new values. Trying to figure out, you know, a guy in his early 30s trying to figure out, gee, well, I'm bored. I'm a sham. Yeah, what's what's of what do I stand for? What's of use to me in the world? And, and getting no answers. He's free. I take it now because I'm yeah, in sure, the sure. Some people say it's they are not good of yours, but I think I, I like them. These are these three soldier party and zombie birdhouse are basically me thrashing around lost in the wilderness of uh, drink drugs rock and roll and uh, just general searching for something mm -hmm. there are very good things on all these albums yep. but they are not they are not as centered they're more eccentric I had become a very eccentric person Finally, after this one, I decided to get my shit together and came up with this one, blah, 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 where I emerged, you know, healthy, clean, disciplined, married with a haircut <laughs> and, uh, and professional production again in the person of Bowie, uh, who was able to, uh, we both made money on the album and everybody was happy. Finally, I made some money off the Ziggy guy and you know, it, was, it worked out well. Yeah. And, uh, it's dead to see because I never can. Once yeah, I right. I never can. Oh, and well. then this one, I was, I, I was having a reaction against that, so I decided to grow my hair and let's make our metal album. And uh, it's in my metal album. Mm -hmm. It's as close as I ever come to a metal album. With Steve Jones on guitar. With Steve Jones on guitar, who, for whom I have a great affection. Mm -hmm. you know? And then I made... That, this one was big for me. And this is my biggest seller. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's it? by, of all time. Brick by Brick's a big it's seller. One of the biggest in the States as well. Mostly. Everywhere. Although, eventually, Lust for Life will probably pass it, I think, because of the catalog sales. But right now, this is the biggie. And... Uh, and I had a hot producer and I had a lot to say. And uh, I'd matured. And uh, I had the best musicians money could buy. So that's what we came up with. My Smash big my album. big Hollywood album, yeah. yeah. 
And so then I got sick of doing that and came out with the really eccentric and strange American Caesar. That's one of your finest. I like it, which is a, basically a rambling, long, and obs obscure political statement on my part. And then I got tired of being so full of shit, <laughs> so full of political statements, and I made this one, which is short and funny and has lots of sexual longing and a silly title.